The scripture reading for today's preach is from Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters into marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Well, good morning to you, church, and welcome to our Sunday service from wherever you're watching this. Maybe you're at home on your couch in the living room. Maybe you're watching it uh, still in bed like Ariel told us that she likes to do. Maybe you're outside uh, on the patio or hey, maybe you're out on a run and, and listening to our service, however you are tuning in this morning. And from wherever you're tuning in, we know there's people joining us from all over the country and either and uh, also other parts of the globe. So thank you for joining us this morning uh, for our Vision Sunday, what we call Vision Sunday, a Sunday that we take, uh, that we set aside to talk a little bit about a specific direction uh, that God might be leading us as a church. So about a year ago this time, I was preparing to leave the church that I had been a pastor at for about 13 years and uh, getting ready to come to Rosebank, which was a really difficult decision. Uh, And let me explain the main reason why I came. So I was back at my interview and after being asked a ton of questions, I had an opportunity to ask some questions and I asked just one question. I said to the committee there, I said, hey, what's on Rosebank's horizon in the next few years? In other words, what big problem are you trying to solve or perhaps what big opportunity are you trying to take hold of? And uh, the guys went around the room and actually all just kind of explained, uh, you know, what was on their hearts and minds. And a lot of it was some of the things that we dealt with last year. And it got to the last person, the core committee chairman, who said this. He said, I don't believe that we are leveraging Rosebank's strategic potential to impact our city. That's what he said. He doesn't believe we are leveraging, we're really using the potential that Rosebank has to impact the city. I got really excited about that. I didn't know too much about Rosebank at the time, uh, but I knew enough to know, yeah, there's a lot of potential here. So the strategic location that we have here as a church, the heritage, 115 years of God's faithfulness, the resources that Rosebank has, not to mention its people, I knew back then that Rosebank Union Church has an incredible opportunity to make a significant impact for the kingdom in the city of Joburg. And I wanted to be a part of that. So I grew up on a a farm. So it wasn't really a farm, it was more like a plot. So 24 acres of just felt. We had a few fruit trees, but really weren't farmers at all. Just like this small holding in the south of Joburg. And in many ways, I kind of grew up with a bit of a kind of rural sort of lifestyle. So my cousin who lived uh, kind of on the same farm, we used to hang out on weekends and we would even take our tents and we'd go out on our bikes and we'd like pitch our tent in the middle of the felt somewhere and just like sleep there kind of overnight. We kind of had this holiday at home. I think at about the age nine or 10 or so, I was helping to like cut the grass and because we were on a plot, that meant driving a tractor, right? That's like, that's my claim to fame. I was driving a tractor, right? At 10 years old, cutting the grass in our farm. So I kind of grew up in this kind of like semi-rural sort of environment that I, that I really loved so much. And I think that a lot of people living in cities today, or even living in the suburbs, but like, you know, really in and around the city, that most people, when they hear that, especially these days, would probably prefer 
to live somewhere a little more outside of town, so a suburb just far removed from the real city centers or even just even further out from that. And I know that because an interesting trend that came up last year in South Africa, a trend that developed, uh, you know, obviously because of the pandemic as well, is the trend of Zoom towns. And if you heard of this, Zoom towns, it was kind of this semigration uh, thing that happened over last year where guys in South Africa who were kind of all forced to work on Zoom as we were all doing a work virtually realized, man, like, why are we doing that here? Like in Joburg and in other major cities, Cape Town stuff as well. And so started moving to these coastal towns. So like Langaban and Cape St. Francis and places like that. Zoo, they became known as Zoom towns as people realized, man, like, you know, the only reason we're living in Joburg or these massive city centers, Durban or Cape Town, it's because of work. So, so why not do that somewhere really nice away from the city? Why do it here in the city? And you can kind of understand that uh, because cities are tough places, tough places to live and to work and be a part of. I mean, all the crime, stress, particular temptations and challenges, not to mention the traffic, right? It's living in a city, being in a city, working in a city is a tough place to maintain a livelihood. Uh, and that's kind of general around the world, but it's certainly true here in Joburg as well. So let's talk a little bit about Joburg and like the challenge of living in Joburg or a city like Joburg. So Gauteng, as you probably know, smallest of all the provinces, makes up one and a half percent of our land mass, so tiny province, yet Gauteng contributes 34% to the country's GDP. Just think about that. That's a third of the country's economic activity taking place in a space of one hundredth of its land, right? And that's not to mention it's 10% of the African continent's GDP is generated here in Gauteng, right? That just gives you a sense, man, of the, all that productivity crammed into this tiny land space, it just gives you a sense of, hey, there's going to be a little pressure, a little bit of pressure around here. Now, of course, that on its own, all that economic activity has made it an attractive place for people to come, the city of gold. And that's why Gauteng is, is also the most densely populated of uh, all of South Africa's provinces. 22%, I think it's closer to 25% of people now in the country live in Gauteng. Again, a quarter of the country's people living in a space that is, makes up one hundredth of the country's space. And that all leads to things like crime because of kind of competition over limited resources. And, and that is why Joburg has twice the, uh, uh, a crime rate, uh, two times higher than any other city in our country. It means living in Joburg you are twice as likely to be affected by a sort of crime than living anywhere else uh, in the country. Not to mention the traffic. I need I say more. Now, we all got a pass on that uh, last year, but we all remember kind of these are part of the challenges of living, of working, of existing, of making your livelihood in our city. That's our lives here as the people of Rosebank in Johannesburg. So now, if you're still with us, please do not take this as a confirmation that God is leading you to move to a Zoom town, if that is what you are considering. And hey, if you're watching this from a Zoom town, I know there's a few of you out there, I know that, that makes you pretty happy to be there. Hey, don't, don't get too carried away, because I want to try and turn the tables on this now uh, and tell you not just about the challenge of living and working and ministering in the city, but the opportunity that we have in living, working, and ministering in a city and in a city like Johannesburg. So Pastor Tim Keller, who's a, a great advocate of just focusing missional efforts in cities, kind of has this joke, I think it's a joke, <laughs> where he says that God loves cities more than he loves other places in the world. So you would come to Joburg and say, God loves Joburg more than any other place in South Africa. And I would just go like, amen to that. And you think, but how can you say something like that? Does God love Joburg, you know, more than other places? And, and then he'll go on to say this. He'll say, well, God loves people 
and there's more people in cities than there are anywhere else, which is kind of true if, if you think about it, right? There is more image of God per square kilometer in Joburg than anywhere else in the country. More image of God in Joburg than anywhere else in the country. So this is all kind of tongue in cheek, that's, but there's some truth in this. It's just in the opportunity of cities. So when God sends Jonah to what he calls the great city of Nineveh, meaning large, and at the time it was one of the largest cities of Nineveh, and Jonah kind of protests against that. Uh, God says this to Jonah, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, right? Maybe that's not a large city by today's standards, but listen to what God is saying. Why, why are you protesting this, Jonah? Shouldn't I not focus on this city with 120,000 people who don't know me? See, it seems like in that instance, this is God going, there's so many people congregated in the city, and I'm sending you to reach that city because of all these people that are gathered there in the city and that don't know their right hand from their left hand, they are lost. Quite simply, the opportunity to make a real impact in saving people from eternal destruction is far greater here in the city than it would be anywhere else. So, I would just say this. We may not like cities very much, and we may be tempted to move out of the cities. But I have a feeling that, in fact, I know God does not dislike cities. And in fact, he is moving in to the cities to make an impact on all the people living there. And God loves Joburg and wants to redeem Joburg and the seven million plus people living in Joburg. And he's going to do that through the redemptive community known as the church. So God does not dislike. He does not withdraw from cities. He's moving into cities. And that is why if you trace the storyline, the development of kind of humanity and civilization from the beginning of Bible to the end, you'll see there's a positive trajectory when it comes to the idea of cities. So let me sketch this out for you just real quick. So right in the beginning, after the flood, the first city that is built is the city of Shinar. And it's in this city that human beings filled with all their pride, build the Tower of Babel, which we know that was not a good idea. And God's judgment came upon them. And a little bit later, we read about the next great cities we come across in the Bible are the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know of their kind of despicable reputation and how therefore God judged and destroyed those cities as well. So far, not looking good for cities. They are everything we know about these places that magnify the worst of humanity, right? So that's so far in the story. But then you get to the story of Joseph and of him moving to Egypt and now living and working in the greatest city on earth at that time, a man whom God uses in a stunning way as his means of redeeming and working out his purposes for the earth and for eternity through this man Joseph in this amazing, great city. And then following from the story of Egypt, I mean, you know how it goes fast forward a few hundred years and we get to the exodus out of Egypt. So things go a little bit south, as you know, and God leads his people out of Egypt through the, prom uh, through the wilderness 40 years until they get to the promised land. And what do the people do when they reach the promised land? They build, they build a city. Not just any city, the city of Jerusalem, right? God's city. 
a place where the Ark of the Covenant would be brought in, a place where the temple would be built, and God would at that time manifest His presence, it would be His kind of earthly dwelling on earth, is in this city, a city known as the city of God where the nations would flock to to see and to hear from God. That's what we'll read all over the Bible. So, for example, in Micah 4 verse 2, it says this, And many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, uh, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's what was known Jerusalem would be the place from where the word of the Lord and the law of God and the glory of God uh, would, would go out from. People would flock to see that. And of course, that is what happened then. As we go over to the New Testament, we read that the gospel of Jesus Christ first went out from the city of Jerusalem. So, for example, Luke 24, verse 46 to 47 says, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from the city of Jerusalem. This is where it's going to start and spread. And it did. And as the early church was born, as the Holy Spirit lit the flame of the church and as it went out, you'll notice it focused its national evangelistic efforts on the major city centers of the world at that time. Rome, Corinth, Athens, Ephesus. This is where the gospel went to into traction. Lastly, fast forwarding a lot as the gospel took root in these major cities and spread from city to city and spread throughout the world from there. If you fast forward to the very end of the Bible, at the end of it all, when finally the curtain closes on life as we know it and we go into this kind of eternal existence, what does that eternal existence look like? What is that place known as? Do we go back to a garden like Eden, said we return? Now we'll read this. One of the very last passages of Scripture, Revelation 21 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven the first earth had passed away, the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so as, again, Tim Keller likes to say, life started in a garden, but it will end in a city. God doesn't hate the city. He loves the city. He loves the people in cities. And God is moving in and redeeming the people in cities and using the people and the influence that comes from cities to be the redemptive nucleus of the missional activities of the church through the world. And so I'll say again, God loves Joburg, loves Joburg, and he's busy redeeming this city and the seven million plus people living here, and he will use the organized Christian community of the church to do that. So, I spoke about the challenge of being here, the challenge of being in any city, and then the opportunity and tracing that through the Bible and God's heart for the city. So now let's talk about specifically a vision for us as a church and for our city. So how do we do this? How do we as Rosebank kind of living here nestled in the center this place of influence? How do we be a part of a mission to this city? So for a long time, for me, Jeremiah 21, uh, sorry, Jeremiah 29, has been a really important chapter guiding uh, me as I've been involved in city churches, guiding us as we think about being a church for the city 
and what that means. Jeremiah chapter 29, in fact, 27, 28, 29. So turn or tap in your Bibles to Jeremiah 29. And while you get there, let me just give you a little bit of a background about what's happening here. And if you were with us last year as we journeyed with Ezra, you'd be familiar with some of the story going on here. So the kingdom of Judah, there were the two kingdoms of God's people. It split into two kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdom. Uh, because of their rebellion and idolatry, first the northern kingdom was destroyed by the Assyrians and wiped out, kind of never to be seen again. And then later, the southern kingdom of Judah came under God's judgment and God used the empire of Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar to judge and they came in and kind of destroyed the city and took everybody away into exile, left just a small percentage of people behind in this broken city of Jerusalem, but took everybody else away to Babylon. We've got Daniel and his contemporaries. We've got Ezekiel prophesying at the time, but we've also got then Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, who is kind of speaking on behalf of God to the people who had been displaced from their home, from Judah, from Jerusalem, and to the people kind of left behind. And Jeremiah knew that God was, was using Babylon and using Nebuchadnezzar as part of his judgment for their idolatry and their rebellion. But Jeremiah knew this was still under the sovereign plan of God. This wasn't evil that had suddenly taken control. And that's what he was trying to remind the people and call them to come back to God. And so at one point, Jeremiah takes this yoke. He takes a literal yoke, you know, like that oxen would wear to pair the oxen to each other and to a plow. And Jeremiah took this yoke and he put it on his neck and he said, here, Judah, see this. This is the yoke that God has put on us. And it is put at, through Nebuchadnezzar. God is using this. In other words, to those displaced, living in the wicked, evil city of Babylon, like this is what God has been doing. It is part of his plan and part of his purpose to redeem us. And then comes another prophet, a false prophet. His name's Hananiah. And you can read this in, in the build up to Jeremiah 29. So in Jeremiah chapter 28, Hananiah comes on the scene. And Hananiah sees this thing of the yoke and Nebuchadnezzar and God using the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar. And Hananiah takes this yoke and he breaks it. And he says, nonsense, nonsense. There's no way that God would have us living in the city of Babylon. Right? Our people, we're the chosen ones, we're the holy ones living in this despicable city we don't belong here, said Hananiah. God is going to come, and within two years, you're going to break that yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, and we're all going to go back home and back to life as normal. And Jeremiah was saying, no, 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 this is going to be this is 70 years of going through this exile as we learn and as God teaches us and humbles us. And so you've got these two prophets and these two messages going out to the people. And so finally, God says this to those people now in exile, in Babylon. Remember, it's God's people, His chosen people, displaced from the holy city, living in Babylon, which was like it's just a metaphor for the most wicked and evil city in the world. Even throughout the Bible, that's what Babylon would be known for. What would God say to those people, His people? living in the middle of the biggest cities, most influential cities, most corrupt evil cities in the world. What is God going to say to them as he settles this message with these two prophets? Well, here's what he says. It's Jeremiah chapter 29 and reading from verse 4 to 8. And it says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles that I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. 
take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Don't decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Seek the welfare of the city I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Make no mistake, this was absolutely outrageous. You can understand why some of these false prophets would think this could not be true. How could God say that? If you know anything about God and the holiness of God and His chosen people and the holy city of Jerusalem and despicable Babylon, it would seem to us that, no, 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 there's got to be this, but it was one of two approaches we can have. God's people living in this wicked city, one of two things we can do. One is separate, withdraw, retreat. We're going to retreat in the middle of this horrible pagan city and we need to protect ourselves and insulate ourselves from the evil, wicked people around there, and we're just going to hold on, hang on here, until God comes and rescues us. Separate and withdraw. That's one approach. That's an approach many Christians take to life today. Here we are, God's people. We're living in this wicked, difficult place. What we're going to do is just isolate, withdraw, separate, insulate, and just hold on and just hope that things change for the better around us or Jesus comes really quickly. So there were some prophets saying to the people of Israel and Babylon, that's what we're going to do. Just two years, we'll just hold out until God destroys them. That's one approach. Another approach you would think is, is kind of an opposite approach. <laughs> So some people might say the best defense is offense, right? So we're going to go on the attack. Insurrection. And maybe, I mean, for God's people living in Babylon, there's no way they would like win an out-and-out war against the Babylonians. But hey, while we're here, we're going to make life as difficult as possible for these wicked, evil people living around us. The only way we can defend ourselves and protect our identity is to go on the attack. Again, an approach that some Christians take to the world today. We're not going to win this war, so we're just going to make it really difficult for people around us until our victory comes. It seems like those are the two options. For God's chosen people, His holy people, living in the midst of a corrupt, evil, difficult city. Except then there comes in Jeremiah chapter 29, this third way this third way so it's not isolation and insulation and it's not insurrection the way of instead of despising the city and because of our hate or dislike for the city therefore withdrawing or attacking instead of despising it we love it love the city, and try to be a community, a redemptive community within the city, being part of it, working for its welfare, praying for its welfare, and hoping that through us, God brings redemption in the city. That's what God was saying to His people in the city of Babylon in Jeremiah 29. And I would summarize that like for us at Rosebank like this. Here, here are the options we have as a church as we think about the city of Joburg and with all of its faults but with all that we love about Joburg as well. Here's, here's our options. So, so we could be a church in the city. So just in the city. Man, we're here. We're, you know, corner of William Nickel and Sanson Drive. It's great. But like, hey, we're just lucky that we got this place. We're just going to hold on to it. We're just going to do our own thing here. Keep our heads down. And just kind of hope that things will get better around us, you know, that Jesus comes really, really quickly. So we don't take an active interest in the city around us. We just do our, our own thing. That's one approach. Just we're here, but 
pay no attention to us and hide. There could be a church in the city just hiding in Joburg. Or, I mean, that other opposite approach, not a church in the city, but a church against the city, where everything that's not distinctly Christian is evil and therefore everyone else is an enemy and it's us versus them. So we could be a church known for what we're against. So a church in the city, a church against the city. By the way, we also don't want to be a church that's simply of the city. So kind of the opposite of against is, no, we love the city, but we love it a little bit too much. We just end up becoming like it, no different to it, and we lose our distinctive identity. As Christian people, we don't want to be a church of the city, which is a major part of what was God was saying to his people in Babylon, is to retain their distinct identity as people of God, but at the same time, seeking the welfare of the city. So against the city, in the city, of the city, man, is there another option? Here's what we want to be. We want to be known as a church that is for the city. For the city. That's this message of Jeremiah chapter 29. A church that is a countercultural, countercultural, redemptive community in the heart of Joburg. A countercultural, redemptive community in the heart of Joburg. A community, a church that is so distinctly different. Like it's obvious in what we believe, in the way that we act, yet at the same time, having such a positive impact on the city around us. In other words, community or a church that's impossible to ignore. Here's the dream. The dream is that when an honest history is written about Joburg in 50 years' time, that history will not be able to exclude mentioning Rosebank Union Church. When an honest history is written about this city, they will not be able to exclude talking about Rosebank Union Church. Now, I want to end with kind of this picture from the Old Testament and that translates into the New Testament. This little glimpse, again, hidden in the Old Testament of God's desire for what cities can be like. Amidst all the bad cities of the Old Testament, he has this little story. And you'll find it come up in a kind of curious way in uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. It's where God instructs Moses as they enter the promised land to build six cities known as cities of refuge. Cities of refuge. And what these cities of refuge were, were these cities scattered at strategic locations uh, around the country uh, so that they could be easily reached uh, by any person living in the land. And the purpose was this. If you happen to accidentally kill somebody, then you could run like quickly because it was accessible to the city of refuge and, and you could be safe. And he was like, why on earth would there be this necessity for these like cities of refuge? Well, in ancient cultures and kind of in this, this Old Testament environment, there was this idea of blood revenge. So if like a family lost a member of its family uh, due to murder, then it became the responsibility of one of the male members of the family to avenge the death of the member of their family by tracking down and killing the person who had killed him, even if it was accidental. That's what's so crazy about this, right? And so the examples given in Scripture is like if you're chopping something with your axe and the axe head flies off and kills your neighbor, you know, then you've murdered him, but accidentally and by law and by culture, they could come after you and kill you back. So apparently this happened like a lot. And so there were these cities of refuge that you could run to for safety if you had you know, accidentally killed somebody. So why am I talking about this? So, so in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 6, it's interesting because 
speaking a lot about Jesus and the ultimate high priest and the transition from the old to the new, there's a reference to Jesus has become our city of refuge. Jesus has become our city of refuge. I want to just, let me just take a few minutes here. Because I want to be faithful, you know, to the Bible here. Because if you go look up cities of refuge, man, it's this crazy, interesting thing. But the, so Jesus becomes a city of refuge. Now, it's not exact. There's a lot of differences between the cities of refuge in the Old Testament and Jesus. For example, there's six of them. There's only one Jesus. And for example, your safety from committing a sin was because you actually you're innocent. Whereas in Jesus, no, 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 it's for the guilty, right? Not just the accidentally guilty, but the intentionally guilty. So there's vast differences here, but in this passage of Hebrews and in the story of around this scripture, it, it speaks about Jesus becoming like this ultimate city of refuge. So there were six of them. And in the Bible, six is always this incomplete number. And seven is complete. So it's like this idea that Jesus becomes this perfect city of refuge where anybody that has transgressed any and every kind of sin can come and the ransom has already been paid. In these old cities of refuge in the six, a ransom had to be paid. But Jesus has paid that ransom through his own bloodshed. And so he becomes a perfect city of refuge. And you can run to him for safety. And again, like the, if you had to draw the parallel, well, the picture isn't this person coming to avenge your blood. It's actually, it's not even God as such. It's the law of God. So it changed. But the idea is still Jesus becomes our refuge. If you run to him, you're saved. But I love keeping that city idea because at the heart of it, that's what we want to be as a church. This countercultural, redemptive community. In other words, a city in a city. Rosebank is this little city in the city of Joburg, a city of refuge. We want to be that city of refuge so distinctly different, so distinctly aligned to Jesus, so obviously for Jesus and the ways of Jesus, but also so obviously for our city on behalf of Jesus. Do you see that? So I've had this phrase in my mind that we've spoken about with staff for, for some time, just this idea of imagine if people got to know Rosebank, if kind of like the word out there is that like, hey, we as a church, we're here, we're for you. Like imagine the broken, the lost, the hurting, the grieving, the struggling. Imagine you know, the poor. Imagine they had that church. They're, you know what? They're for you. Like we're for you. Not against you. And we're for Joburg. We're postured towards, for Joburg, for you, for Joburg, for Jesus. On behalf of Jesus. Because of Jesus. And as an act of worship to Jesus. For you, for Joburg, for Jesus. That's our prayer. That's the kind of church we become given the opportunity, our God-given opportunity that we have. Let's pray that that happens. God, we gather before you this morning, scattered around Joburg, or scattered around the country, people who have a connection and a, a life in Joburg in some way, and all of us with a desire, I hope, I think, with a desire to see this city transformed by your gospel, Lord Jesus. And we know that you've put that in our hands as Christians, as churches that have been planted in these cities. But we know especially here at Rosebank Union Church, you've, you've put that in our hands. You've given us this platform, this opportunity, this potential to make a significant impact in the city of Joburg. And so we pray simply, God our Father, Lord Jesus, that you would show us and ignite within us a passion for your name, your glory. May we be salt and light, bearing the distinctiveness of the people of God, but in a re 
redemptive way in the city around us. Holy Spirit, fill us to do this work. In Jesus' name, amen.